I know. And we're going to go ahead and share that screen. And I'm going to go ahead and do a live transcript. We're going to go ahead and do captions for this. If it'll let me. Are you going to let me? And captions. Captions. Captions, please. Show ca uh, we don't need to show captions. It'll do it for us. Okay. So the last time that we were here, we were talking about color perception. And now today, uh, we're going to talk about some of the different uses of color vision. So um, I made sure to wear a sweater with some bright blue in it today. Also, I discovered that cashmere um, doesn't really wrinkle. So this is going to come into handy on the come in handy on the Dublin trip because I can wear it over and over again and it's not going to wrinkle. Also, I really like the color. So um, the last time that we were here, we were talking about the component or we were talking about double opponent cells. So double opponent cells are basically a lot like single opponent cells or cone opponent cells cells in the lateral geniculate nucleus. Now, for those of you who were not here to talk about this, um, I just want to give you a quick reminder about these single opponent cells. First of all, single opponent cells are in the lateral geniculate nucleus. These are in the thalamus. Double opponent cells are in the primary visual cortex. So our single opponent cells they are going to respond to one particular light cone in the center and a different cone in the surround. So they will either be red, green, or they'll be blue, yellow. Now, as a quick reminder and a quick review, do we have yellow cones? Why do we have a blue versus yellow opponency? What is yellow made up of? Yeah, Sarah Compton. Right. So yellow, yellow light is a metamer of red and green light combined. So when you combine red and green light, you're hitting those medium wavelengths and you're going to get yellow. So in a single opponent cell that is blue versus yellow, you're basically comparing your short wavelength cones to both your medium and your long wavelength cones. Here, this is a long cone in the center. So this is a cone that will be best excited by red light shined in the center and a surround that is inhibitory for medium cones. So red light is going to produce the best response right in the center. Green in the surround is going to produce the worst response. And if we have diffuse red light or diffuse green light, we're going to get neutral responses because we're going to get some excitation, but we're also going to get some inhibition, and that's going to basically cancel everything out. Now, on the up, notice here, though, when we traverse a border, so here we've got some red light getting closer to the center, so this is going to have less green in the surround, so we get less inhibition. This one's even better because we have red in the center, but we also have just a little bit of green in that surround. Um, double opponent cells happen in the primary visual cortex. So here, here's what we're going to find. Here, red light excites the center, but green light in the center inhibits. In the surround, red light inhibits and green light excites. So we can have both excitation in the center and in the surround, provided that we're getting the right kind of information. So here, again, we have a diffuse green light. We get a neutral response. Same if we're talking about red. We have excitation from the center, but we get cancellation from the surround. Here, we have inhibition in the center, but we get excitation in the surround. So they're going to cancel each other out. The worst possible position is this one. We have full inhibition from green, and we have a little bit of inhibition from red in the surround. So this is going to produce the worst response. Here, this is going to be the best because we have excitation in the center, and we have a little bit of excitation from green in the surround. So double opponent cells work best 
when we're traversing color borders. So the best stimulus for a single opponent cell in the lateral geniculate nucleus is going to be light purely in the center or light purely in the surround. Here, we have a specific light in the center and a specific light in the surround. So this is designed to help us traverse borders of color, such as the stripes in my sweater. So we're gonna get certain amounts of firing from double opponent cells when we traverse those color boundaries of blue and white. Okay, I need to put this on to duplicate. There we go, much better. So is there a color specific area in the visual cortex? So at the primary visual cortex level, we do have the blobs, which we talked about. You'll remember we talked a little bit about hypercolumns. We talked about blobs. Uh, we have what is called the thin stripe region of area V2, secondary visual cortex. And we do have in V2 globs. So we have globs, thin stripes, and globs. Such scientific names. We've done a great job. Um, but research by Zeki has mentioned area V4. V4 seems to be critical for processing color. There's a problem though. V4 doesn't just process color. Researchers have actually found that V4 actually responds to shape as well. So it's not a process pure area. It also responds to shape. But some of the best evidence that we have for color specific processing has occurred in people that have the disorder achromatopsia. So achromatopsia is basically not being able to see color specifically due to cortical damage. There are a lot of different ways that you can be colorblind. Achromatopsia though is specifically at the cortical level. Other types of colorblindness that we're gonna talk about today are because people lack cones or because people lack photopigments, four cones. Those are in the eyes. Achromatopsia only occurs with damage to parts of the visual cortex. Seems like that might actually be a really good essay question. What's the difference between color anomalous vision and achromatopsia? Might be a good idea. I have to think about it. All right. Does anybody need some more time here? I think you're gonna like this next section a little bit more because we're gonna talk about some of the different uses of color vision. We're gonna talk about different types of color illusions and we're gonna talk about understanding color names. So if you enjoyed our brief discussion the other day about Crayola crayon names like Razzmatazz, Macaroni and Cheese, Robin's Egg Blue, um, Tiffany blue, things like that, you're really going to like this section. So now uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of the different uses of color vision. And in particular, we're going to talk about the individual differences that people have with respect to color processing. So we're gonna talk about the language that we use to describe different colors. And we're gonna talk about those color, defi color vision deficiencies. So we're gonna talk about what the world looks like when you lack a cone, or when you lack a photopigment in a cone, or if you have no cones at all, or you only have one cone. Here's a hint. If you only have one cone, because of the principle of univariance, you will not see color. Um, we're gonna talk about some color contrast and some different types of illusions. I may uh, take a quick break so that you can share color illusions that you like with me that I haven't necessarily heard about. And then we'll talk about color constancy. Finally, we'll finish up by talking about why it has been proposed that you and I have this ability to see in color. And for those of you who really like learning about animals, we will talk about different types of color vision in animals. Turns out chickens have more cones than you do. In that respect, chickens are better than you. 
<laughs> okay. Chickens are not better than you. Like you are wonderful to have in class. I, I shudder to think what it would be like to have a class full of chickens. <laughs> okay. So we're gonna start by talking about some different individual differences in color processing. So I wanna get back to the issue of qualia. And this was a test question. I see the color blue. How can I be sure that the color blue that I see matches what you see? And the general consensus was, well, you can't know somebody's private subjective experience for sure, but what we do know is that most of us are more alike in our processing than we are different. And as a result, we can make the claim that we have pretty good reason to believe we all tend to see the same thing, even if we can't get into each other's heads. So qualia, as a reminder, is your conscious private experience of sensation and perception. And we do have really good evidence with respect to how we name colors that most people see color the same way and process color the same way. And this is true across cultures and across languages. So as I kind of mentioned, there's general agreement on the perception of color. And some of the best evidence that most people see color the same way comes from the terminology that we use for basic colors. So uh, basic colors are single words that describe colors and generally they have meanings that are agreed upon by speakers of a language. Based on research that people have done, we tend to consider 11 different basic colors. So we have red, blue, yellow, green, black, white, brown, pink, orange, purple, and gray. And a lot of this has come from work by people like Lindsay and Brown, where people had to name different color patches. Now, one of the things that you'll kind of notice about all of those focal color names, they're short. Notice that most of these are at least one syllable. Purple and yellow and orange have two. But by and large, we tend to find that focal colors have very short names. Now, it does get a little bit more complicated when we think about foreign languages. For example, yellow in our language has two syllables. Amarillo, which is yellow in Spanish, has four. So it is going to be a little bit complicated when we talk about different languages. And I don't speak French. What is yellow in French? Does anybody know? I'm gonna look it up and I'm probably gonna mangle the pronunciation of this because I learned Spanish and in Spanish you pronounce everything and in French you don't, um, but I'm gonna try. And I'll try to look up German too because while I cannot speak German, I can pronounce it. Um, okay, yellow in French, jaune. Yellow in French is jaune, so that's pretty short. And I probably mangled the pronunciation. Um, yellow in German. What is yellow in German? Gelb. Nice. That's yellow in German. So for the most part, basic colors have really short names. Focal colors have really short names. So uh, people have actually named different color patches. So what you're looking at here are the different naming patches that people have provided. And here, this is basically people agreeing whether or not it's a basic color. So here's what I want you to notice as you're looking at all of these. Notice that all of these are the 11 basic colors. Here's what I want you to pay attention to. Look what's pretty close. Peach, teal, lavender, and maroon, reference to Taylor Swift's Midnights right there. Um, we have things like tan, gold, turquoise, burgundy, aqua, violet, salmon, magenta, olive, fuchsia, lime, periwinkle, lilac, mustard, beige, black, flash. What a terrible name. Also, not all flesh is peachy colored. Um, forest, oh, one of my favorites, chartreuse. Coral, rust, mauve, 
navy, chocolate, wine, sky, and goldenrod. So what's interesting is that peach, lavender, teal, and maroon are actually pretty close to being basic colors. And it is entirely possible that in the future, based on how frequently people name it as a basic color, these may actually be considered basic color someday. Um, but one of the things that I want you to notice, um, notice that we have a lot of shades. Notice that these colors that are less likely to be basic colors are shades of a basic color. So for example, sky blue, navy blue, aqua blue, turquoise, they're less likely to be used as a basic color than the categorical hue which is why I find lavender kind of interesting. Lavender is interesting to me because technically it's a shade of purple, but it's close enough and different enough that it could be considered a basic color. Teal actually makes sense. It's not really a shade of blue or green. It is a blue-green shade. Actually, that kind of looks like a dark teal, Claire, a little bit, like a very dark blue or green in your shirt, kind of a little bit. Um, so it makes sense that teal would be a basic color. It doesn't make as much sense for lavender and maroon, which are very specific shades of red. Another thing that I want you to notice as you're looking at these different color names, notice that the basic colors tend to have pretty short names. Notice as we kind of move through these offshoot colors, the names get longer or they get a bit more specific. So burgundy, periwinkle, uh, chartreuse, goldenrod, vermilion, which is a shade of red. Now there are some uh, there are some different colors that don't look like this, like puce. And I need to look up puce because I always forget what puce is. Puce is a dark red or a brown purple color. That's one of the few instances where you have something with a short name, but it's not a basic color. Okay, so another term for basic colors is focal colors. So as I kind of mentioned, we do have some important differences between our focal colors and what we call our non-focal colors. Focal colors, Usually, we have some exceptions to this, usually are going to have a shorter name. So green versus chartreuse. You know how some of y'all get nervous when you see red on a paper, like when somebody grades your paper? My uh, AP English teacher in junior year thought that red would damage our self-esteem, so she graded our papers in chartreuse. Now I get that feeling when I see chartreuse even though I love it. Um, additionally, focal colors are usually gonna be a very general common hue. Non-focal colors are usually gonna be shades of that hue, or they're going to be combinations of focal colors. So lavender is kind of a shade of purple. Mustard is a shade of yellow and additionally has a little bit of brown thrown in for good measure. So you can kind of see the relationship between basic colors and these non-focal colors. If you, have, by the way, I'm really good at discriminating colors, like noticing differences. If you need somebody to help you pick different shades of paint, I'm really good at distinguishing different shades of white paint. I'm like, that needs a little more brown. This one needs a little more green. Like, I'm very talented at picking paint. An individual difference that we haven't really talked about very much, researchers have actually found that there are some gender differences in color discrimination between people who identify as female and people who identify as male. Um, now, if you were talking to an evolutionary psychologist, they would probably say that in general, women are better at discriminating between colors because hunter gatherer finding good berries, blah, and things like that. I'm not necessarily sure that that's the answer, but we do know that women in general, obviously there are gonna be some individual differences there, but if you identify as female, you have an easier time discriminating between different colors than if you identify as male. Okay, 
But occasionally we do find some evidence that we might see color differently. Has anybody here had a class with Dr. Quick? And y'all have talked about the sapir wharf hypothesis maybe a little bit. Does that sound familiar at all? Maybe. We've talked about it in cognitive psych, though, so I can bring that up. Um, so there is this idea that the words that you de use define how you see the world. So this is referred to as cultural relativism. So if I only have two words for color, it has been proposed by some people that if I only have two words for color, one to describe warm colors and another to describe cool colors, that that may influence how I see the colors around me. So if you have a lot of color words, you can make those finer distinctions between different colors. If you don't have that many, that discrimination is not possible. So other cultures describe color differently, and researchers have suggested that it may potentially affect how members of a culture process color. Uh, researchers call this linguistic determinism. What this basically means is that the words that you use and the language that is available to your culture defines your perception. Anybody need some more time here? Is there something interesting going on? Um, maybe we don't drink that. <laughs> okay. So I want to give you an example and some different studies that have been done um, with linguistic determinism. And for those of you that have had me for cognitive psych, some of this might be a little bit of a retread. Um, so we know that English has several basic color words. We have red, blue, green, yellow, orange, and things like that. Researchers have talked about the Dani people of New Guinea. Now, there are other tribes of people in New Guinea that have different color words, but specifically the Dani people have uh, two color terms. They have Mili for dark or cold hues, and they have Mola for bright or warm hues. Now, if cultural relativism and linguistic determinism are true, this means if you only have two color words, you should perceive color differently than people who have many color terms. So we'll get back to that in just a second. So one of the ways that they've tested this with groups of people like the Danny and others is by doing a color categorization task. So they give you a card and then they have you choose between which of these matches the color that you just saw. Now, they do this in a couple of different ways. So in one instance, they give you this and they give you a kind of a shade that's very similar, but it's a different color, right? This one's blue, this one's green. This is gonna be a pretty easy discrimination to make. It's clearly this one. However, when we start getting into two colors that are drawn from the same hue, that's a harder discrimination to make. Which one is it? What's interesting is that when you give this color categorization task to people who don't have many color words to name their basic colors, they have an easier time with between, with a, a crop, like those different color comparisons when they're different hues compared to when they're part of the same hue. So we do find that this one is easier because you're comparing blue and green. And this is found across a variety of cultures, not just English speakers. Here's another example from your textbook. So here, they have to basically identify the miss the uh, color that does not match. So in this particular instance, um, we have two shades of red and we have two shades of brown. And what we generally find is that people tend to be the slowest when they have to make discriminations within the same shades of, or between different shades of the same hue. So here we have two shades of red. People have a hard time identifying which one doesn't match. Here, 
they have two different types of brown. Again, they have a harder time when they have to look at two different shades of the same color. However, they have a really easy time discriminating between two um, shades of brown versus this shade of red, which pops out more easily. And again, this discrimination ability where it's harder for us to discriminate between shades of the same hue versus different hues, we find this widely across cultures, even for cultures that do not use our terminology for basic colors. So even though different groups of people have different color terms and may only have two, we have reason to believe that they perceive color similarly to us. So generally, uh, research by Roche and colleagues with the Danny people actually did find that initially it was easier for people who speak English to process vocal colors. But you have a confound here. These are the same color terms that you've been using all your life, and they're generally very easy for us to do. So is it because of familiarity or is it specifically because of the color terms that we use? When you remove familiarity from the equation and you give both groups of people nonsense terms to name different colors, um, both Dani and English groups ended up doing better with vocal colors, indicating that even though the Dani people only had two words for color, they largely perceive color similarly. <laughs> okay, now I want to talk about something a little bit more fun. Like, not that that wasn't fun, but um, I'm going to show you some examples of what the world might look like if your world was deprived of some of the colors. Because we do know that some people do see color differently. And that's because these people specifically have deficiencies in processing aspect of color. Now, oftentimes the term that we're going to use is color blindness. However, if we wanted to be more appropriate, we would call it color anomalous vision. Now, one thing that we know, and I am getting into uh, chromosomes here, color, color processing, like genes that code for color deficiencies, like color blindness genes, they tend to reside on an X chromosome. And so, and additionally, I will mention, it's a recessive trait. It is not a dominant trait. So that means that if you have an additional X chromosome, odds are gonna be pretty good that you've got a dominant variant of that gene that will basically cancel out the recessive gene. However, if you only have one X chromosome, and let's say, as with many people who have the sex of male, they typically will have a Y chromosome, although it's not always perfect. There are some complications there, but the Y chromosome doesn't really carry a lot of genes. And so if you have a recessive gene on your X chromosome, there's nothing on the Y chromosome that will cancel that out. As a result, one of the things that we do find is that there are sex differences with respect to um with respect to colorblindness. Um, people who are assigned male at birth, uh, colorblindness occurs at about a rate of 8%. Compare that to people who are assigned female at birth and they tend to have a 0.05% rate of color deficiency. Does anybody here actually know somebody who's colorblind? Yeah, I know like two people. Yeah? He's got red green. Red green is the most common type. Anybody else? My sister's high school boyfriend had an abnormality in his pupil. Um, so you know how most pupils and irises are round? Because of the ways his eyes developed, they were kind of cat-like and very oval in shape. And because of that, he ended up being completely colorblind. And I remember one time asking him how he was able to drive a car if he couldn't see any of the lights. And he reminded me that, yes, I can't see the color, but when the light changes, the luminance on the lights change, like the brightness changes, and that he could notice. Still, he drove at night. That's kind of scary when I think about it. 
Um, so we call this color anomalous vision. Like if you want to be technical, that's what we should call it because most people with color blindness actually can discriminate between colors. They are not totally colorblind. Here's the thing, people with red green color blindness, they experience the colors red and green as colors. However, their discrimination between red and green is going to be different than somebody without that impairment. They're going to see it as a weird brown color, and it's going to be harder for them to distinguish. So even though we call them colorblind, that's not technically the appropriate term. It doesn't accurately describe what they can and can't do. So we're going to talk about three major types of um color anomalies. So we're going to start specifically by talking about what happens with each of the cones. So you can have color blindness in one of two ways. You either have color blindness because you lack a cone or you have color blindness because there is a problem with photopigment in one of your cones. So you're going to hear me make a distinction between between those different types. So we're gonna start with what is called deuteranopia. Deuteranopia is probably the most common type of colorblindness or deuteranomaly. So usually if people have red green colorblindness, it's either because they have deuteranopia or they have deuteranomaly. So deuteranopia is when you don't have M cones entirely. So you basically have dichromacy. Because you don't have those medium wavelength cones, remember that your long cones code for red. They also code for part of green. But because you don't have those M cones, you're not really going to be able to distinguish easily between red and green. So the world will kind of appear like blue and yellow. So what you're looking at here is what this dichromacy would look like. So up in the top corner, we have our wheel of fortune wheel. This is what it looks like to you and I. This is hypothetically what it would look like if you were a deuteranope. Basically, your world is in shades of blue, yellow, and brown. Um, additionally, one of the ways that we can test this here is with what's called an Ishihara test. So I know it's kind of hard to see, but what can you see right here? What number do you see? Eight. Okay, cool. Nobody has deuteranopia or deuteranomaly. Congratulations. If you could not distinguish that, we might want to get you checked out for that. Now, I mentioned that you can also be colorblind, not because you lack a cone, but because your cone doesn't produce appropriate photopigment. This would be called deuteranomaly. So for whatever reason, your M cones have an anomaly. So in this case, the peak sensitivity is not shifted towards green and yellow. Instead, it is shifted towards the long wavelength cones, which means you have less sensitivity to green. And again, you will look very much like a deuteranope. Yeah, you have a question, Caitlin. What do you mean? Like, what are colorblind glasses? Oh, okay. What do they provide that helps them see? Okay, so I just did a Google on this because I've never heard of this before, and it sounds amazing. Um, let me take a look. So. There's a company that's called Enchroma. Um, they filter light to alleviate the red-green color cone sensitivity overlap. So let's take a look at how they work. So uh, basically, ah, I don't need to buy these. An ad popped up, take 20% off. You don't, I give my email out to every company. I need to quit. I have spam email. Um, so basically what they do, it's filtering. So remember how we kind of talked last time about passing light through a filter? 
Um, what it's basically doing, it is selectively filtering out wavelengths where red and green are most likely to overlap. So they, um, and I'm quoting them here. They develop optical lens technology that selectively filters out wavelengths of light at the point where this confusion or excessive overlap of color sensitivity occurs. They alter the signal to the M and L cones in such a way that there's greater color contrast across the so-called confusion line for the individual. So basically it's doing this through filtration. So it's kind of filtering out those points where it could be red, but it could be green. So for example, um, this actually looks like it could be one of those confusion points. So it would try to filter out areas so that it becomes less confusing. You're still probably not going to see red and green the way that somebody with out this problem would, but you're going to see it better than you did, ideally. Okay, so the ne next one that we're gonna talk about is protonopia. Protonopia is when you lack an L cone. And once again, you can kind of see that it's gonna look really similar to deuteranopia. So here we have a pride flag. I realize this is not the most recent version of the pride flag, but you can kind of see here that when we take that pride flag and we basically, if we did not have L cones, this is what it would look like. Again, the world is gonna look very blue, yellow, and brown. So again, with protonopia, we are lacking our L cones. So again, we're gonna have that dichromacy. We only really see blue and yellow. Um, additionally, um, we can have um, proto-anomaly. So whereas with deuteranomaly, it was the M cones peak sensitivity that shifted toward the L cones, in proto-anomaly, it is the L cone sensitivity that is peaking more towards the medium cones. And as a result, we have a reduced sensitivity to red. So most of the time with people that have color anomalous vision, it's usually gonna be a problem with a medium cone or it's gonna be a problem with a long wavelength cone. Um, and so those glasses will probably work pretty similarly. And because red and green have so much overlap in terms of their cone response, um, it's part of the reason why protonopia and deuteranopia, they look really similar because there's already so much overlap between the red, the medium and the long wavelength cones. I was about to say the red or green cones, but we gotta be appropriate. <laughs> okay, so this is the most common, but let's talk about something a little different. What if you don't have an S cone? What would the world look like? Do you think the world would look like this if you lacked an S cone? Probably not, right? Welcome to Tritonopia. So we don't really talk about this. So there is no, there's no known record of a Tritonomaly. So not an anomaly with your short wavelength cones, but Tritonopia is when you have no S cones. Again, you have dichromacy and you have blue, yellow color blindness. Um, in this particular instance, this is what the pride flag would look like if you had tritinopia. It would look blue and pink. And I know what some of you are thinking, that sounds great, a blue and pink world, but you can't see red and green. Um, I want to talk about two other conditions of color anomalous vision. Now these two conditions literally do produce color blindness. Um, so first we can have what is called a cone monochromat. Monochromat means they only see one color. In this case, they're gonna see a lot of gray. And that's because when you have only one cone, remember our principle of univariance. If you only have one type of cone, that cone is going to be responsive to a lot of different wavelengths 
intensity combinations and it can't tell the difference between them. You need other cones to be able, you need at least another cone to be able to make some discrimination. And we know that the best color discrimination comes when you, for us anyway, comes when you have three. So if you only have one type of cone, you are colorblind. Now, because cones are really good with detailed vision, your uh, visual acuity is going to be really solid, right? You can still have good acuity, um, and you're not really going to have a lot of other vision impairments. You can also be what is called a rod monochromat. That means you have no cones, and you are operating solely on rods, which means, first of all, you're not seeing color. Additionally, cones work pretty well in bright light. Do rods work well in bright light? Not at all. Rods work best in dim light. So if you're a rod monochromat, you won't see color. You are going to have a lot of problems with your vision in bright light because rods don't do that. So you will have some photophobia. And remember that rods aren't very detailed. They tend to exist in the periphery and not in our centermost vision. So you're also not going to get good detail. So look at this flower. You can still see the detail of the flower if you're a cone monochromat. Here's what it would look like if you were a rod monochromat. You're not really going to be able to see anything. And I might have a couple of test questions that I've already written up about some of these different types of anomalies. Okay, so that was pretty interesting, right? You don't usually get to hear, of, I don't normally get to talk about this kind of stuff, so it's one of my favorite sections. Okay, so additionally, that's all based on what's going on in your retina, but as I mentioned, there are some other anomalies, but these are going to be related to brain damage, not the eyes itself. So as, as we've already talked about, there is a chromatopsia. Here, you have an inability to see color due to brain damage, typically to V4 or other related areas. Now, something that's kind of related, but is not an inability to see color is called anomia. So this means without name. So anomia literally translates to without name. Now, in this case, these people can see color they can process color. They don't have any color deficiencies, but they can't name them. But this doesn't just apply to colors. People with anomia can't name any objects. And again, this is usually going to be due to brain damage. So they won't have trouble processing color, but they will have trouble naming the color, just as they would any other object that they encounter. All right, everybody good? Okay, so let's have some fun with colors. Let's have some fun with colors and talk about illusions and stuff. Okay, so one of the things that you need to know is that you and I do not see colors in isolation. Most of the time we are going to have other colors that are present in a scene. And the thing is, our experience of a particular color is going to be influenced by the presence of other colors. So for example, what you're looking at here is what is referred to as color contrast. So the color of one region will introduce the opponent color in a neighboring region. So here's my question. So I've got this lovely looking olive green bar. What side of this bar looks more green? Which one looks greener to you? Caitlin, what are you saying? The side that's on the red? Okay, how many of you think the side on the, the red side looks greener? How many of you say the green side looks greener? How many of you are like, I can't tell Dr. Gilchrist, it's really hard? You're like, eh, it's okay. 
All right, what we do actually find, if you want to bring a color out more, you put its opposing color in the background. This side, and I know that when we project it on a screen, it's a little hard to see, but if you look at these on your computer, the side that is on red should appear slightly more green than the side that is in the green. So we want to put something in its opposing color. If you want to make blue stand out, put it against a yellow black background. If you want to make yellow stand out, put it against a blue background. Those sort of things. And that's really easy to do here at Cotty because, well, those are our colors. So that kind of helps. So this is called color contrast. All right, here's some fun with colors. All right. Let's talk about colors A and B. What can you tell me about color B relative to color A? What do you want to tell me? Yeah, Claire. B is lighter than, is it? Is it? It's not. <laughs> okay, this one's really cool. I will explain and then we'll watch a YouTube video and I will actually pause recording for that because I don't want to be copyright claimed. Okay. Okay, this is, okay. I, I, so when I was in college, when the internet was kind of brand new, you would just go to random websites and they'd be like, here, look at this funny illusion. So I first saw this in college and I'm like, what? Let's explain a little bit about how this happens. So right here, here's where it gets kind of tricky. We have a problem. We have a cylinder that is basically casting a shadow. So here's the thing. B is the same color as A. I am not trying to mess with your head. You can do the little droplet device on those two different shades and you will find that they are in fact the same color. You can even do this old school in Microsoft Paint like I did when I was in college. Um, but here's the thing, the cylinder adds a shadow. You assume that this must be darker because it's in shadow and you ba your brain basically discards that darker part and makes it look lighter because, oh, it's under a shadow. You're just gonna have to trust me on this one. Now, I am gonna show you a video that kind of demonstrates this as well. Um, but yeah, I love I love this illusion. It still breaks my brain. All right, we're gonna pause, share, and we're gonna pause recording. They did not change the color. Go find, go find it online and go find it for yourself. I promise you it's real. Um, I promise you it's real. Nobody like, do you see now why I like being a psychologist? I almost became a chemical engineer, y'all. Like I, I like this better because I get to share optical illusions and I get to explain how they work. <laughs> okay. So uh, colors also bleed into each other. So what you're looking at here is color assimilation. So I want to give you another example of color contrast. So again, color contrast is basically when we find that a color will appear brighter when it's presented in contrast to its opposing color. So this red looks redder than this red. This green looks greener than this green. This yellow looks more yellow than this yellow. And this blue looks more blue than this blue. So if you want to make something really pop, pair it with its opposing color. We kind of do this with eyeshadow, with makeup. They're like, if you're brown-eyed, wear purple. If you're blue-eyed, apparently y'all are supposed to wear like copper or orange to make your colors pop because of color contrast. Um, and if you're green, you want something like pink. Same idea. Um, but color assimilation is different. Color assimilation is when colors, neighboring colors, actually take on the chromatic quality of each other. So here, this blue square has been intercut with red. And so it looks a little more purple. 
This one's been cut with green, and so you can see that the shades of blue look a little bit different when they're intercut with different colors. This yellow looks more green, this one looks more red because of what it's been intercut with. So I'm gonna show you another example of this. Um, I love this one, this is, okay. So do those all look like they're different colors? Yes, yes, they look like they're different colors. Like these are kind of red, maybe some of them are kind of blue or pink. Here's what they really look like. They're all the same color, but it's because of what we intercut them with that it changes their appearance. Am I breaking your brain, Caitlin? Yeah. Yeah, I know. I'm going to show you another one. Um, those of you that have had me for cognitive psych, you've seen this one as well. Oh, I have it here. Cool. Okay. What color do those spirals look like? They look like blue and green, yeah? Uh, they're not. Um, they're actually the same color. If you really don't believe me, I can pull this up at the end of class. Because if you get right down here in this corner, you can really tell that this shade right here matches this shade. The only thing that makes it different is the color that I'm intercutting the spiral with. The one that looks more blue is cut with purple. The one that looks more green is intercut with orange. So they take this one takes on a warmer quality. This one takes on a cooler quality. They are the exact same shade. Color assimilation. Okay. Now we also experience some colors only in relation to other colors. So an unrelated color, um, usually we're going to experience that in isolation, but we can have what are referred to as related colors. Uh, related colors are often going to be colors like brown or gray that are often only seen when we are trying to relate different colors to each other. So it's a color, a uh, related color is basically perceived to belong to an area of an object that is in relationship to other colors. So for example, um, these different shades of gray, even though they're the same shade, based on what we intercut them with, the shades of gray look different based on what we're intercutting them with. This gray looks darker because it's intercut with white. This gray looks a little lighter because it's intercut with black. So our experience of gray depends on what we are basically interconnecting with that color. You're gonna share these with all of your friends or you're gonna try to prove how I'm wrong for every single one of these. Either way, I don't mind which one you do because it shows that I got your attention and that's what counts. You are interested and that's what counts. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about after images. So I'm gonna hide these controls by the way. So after images kind of occur when you see a visual image after the stimulus has been removed. So uh, one of the things that I sometimes like to do, if I move my hand slowly enough, sometimes I can see a little bit of the fading image of where my fingers just were. Um, additionally, I know that many of you like to play with sparklers, um, or maybe you liked to play with sparklers. Um, during 4th of July or other opportunities when you have fireworks, or maybe you turned off um, an old TV and you can see the fading image on the TV as it disappears. All of those things are going to be after images. But when we start talking about colors, really interesting things start to happen with respect to after images. And I did have to go through be, uh, and modify some of these slides because some of my favorite illusions no longer pop up, which made me kind of sad. 
So basically what you're kind of getting here is a fading trace of your visual memory. Now, when you're talking about color, one of the things that you will experience is something called a negative after image. So a negative after image is basically an after image that's it, the image of it is actually the opposite of the original stimulus that you saw. So for example, light stimuli will produce dark after images. If you want to hear an example of how I can embarrass myself and also this will not surprise you knowing that I teach this course. When I was about 10 years old, I discovered that if you look at a light bulb long enough and then you go look at a white wall, you will see the after image of the light bulb, but in black. So I may have stared at light bulbs a little too much when I was maybe 10 or 11 years old. And you wonder why I am the way I am. Basically, you wonder why I teach sensation and perception. It's because of things like this. Um, additionally, with the after images, in addition to black and white, you will also get red and green. So if you stare at red too long, it will appear green if you look at a white wall. If you look at blue for too long, the after image will appear yellow and vice versa. So we're going to look at a few. So I want you to stare at the. So first of all, I want to show you this. Can we uh, can we agree that these all look gray? We can all agree these look gray. Yes. Now, I'd like you to stare up uh, with that. I'd like you to stare as long like we're going to stay on this for like a minute. I want you to stare at the black dot in the center of the screen. And I want you to do your best to try not to blink. Now, I know you're going to blink. It's okay if you blink, but I want you to look at that as long as you can. We're going to look at this for about one minute. So um, I'm going to go ahead and time us. You're like, I already started, Dr. Gilchrist. How could you do this to me? Okay, we'll go ahead and say 30 seconds. How about that? <laughs> okay, I'll do it too. Just keep staring, just keep staring. <laughs> Okay, now I'm going to go back to that next slide and I want you to see, do they look gray or are they starting to look like they have color? Are you ready? Okay. They're a little pastel, aren't they? That's your negative after image. Look back at the center, the color is coming from that. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Here's another one. I won't stay on this too long because this one kind of makes people's heads hurt. <laughs> If you move your eyes around, it's going to look like the different dots are blinking. Okay, I'll turn. I'll turn. Okay. Now, here's another one I showed in my Gen Sight classes. You're going to like this one. Yes, thank you. Um, we're going to look at the vanishing fluff. So I'm going to show you uh, some vanishing fluff in the center of the screen. Stare at the black dot and the fluff will begin to disappear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it does that. You want to know how that works? Okay. Here's a big explanation. So don't write this down. But um, when you're staring at the black dot and your eye is moving around, and let's be very clear, your eye is always going to be moving. Um, your eyes are temporarily storing that image. So you have a sensory memory of that image. The after image is going to kick in and basically cancel out that stored memory. So if I'm processing blue, the after image of yellow is going to kick in and they're going to cancel each other out, creating that gray appearance. There's a really cool one. One of you needs to find it for me. Um, there's one about a purple dot that goes around in a circle. And the longer that you look at it, it starts to grow or glow green. And then it erases all of the dots in the circle. If somebody can find that for me, that would be great because I had a link to that and the link no longer works. Um, but try to see if you can find that disappearing dot that eats all of the circles. That would be cool. 
Um, now let's talk about color constancy. So those of you probably don't know this about me. Um, I used to drive a PT Cruiser. It was an electric blue PT Cruiser, so a little darker than the color of the stripes on my sweater. Um, there's a reason I don't drive it anymore. It wasn't a very good car, um, but I used to have to drive to work. And you know how much fun that is during daylight saving time where you come in, it's bright out, you drop off your bright blue car, and then you come out and it's dark. And here's my question. Do you, any of you think that I looked at my car and went, oh my gosh, that is a completely different car? Probably not, right? So one of the things that it's really tempting to think is that we make judgments of color based on purely the wavelength. And that would be wrong because that would mean that in conditions where lighting is dim, we would see things in a different color than when they're in the light. If wavelength is all that matters, then just changing the lighting should change how we see color. And yet, that is not what happens because our brain takes context into account. So the color of the surface is going to appear similar to us regardless of the lighting that we find ourselves in. Yes, even in the dark when lighting is awful and color discrimination is hard. Now, this will be surprising to some people because if color is based on the wavelengths that are reflected, and if there's less light to go around, we should detect a color change. The reason that we don't though, is because your brain takes into context that either more or less light is available. It, we discount the light that illuminates the surface. We don't consider that the sun is out or that it's dark. We determine the true color based on the ratio of cones that are activated. And that ratio is the same regardless of whether it's dark or light. Did you have a question, Chastity? Uh, can we share that after class? That would be great. I love that. That is my favorite illusion and I could not find it. Yes, Sarah. The lilac chaser. Okay, cool. Look that up after class. It's a lot of fun. The lilac chaser. Um, so this is what's known as retinex theory. So basically... The ratio of cones that are activated for a particular color will be the same regardless of whether there is more light available or less light available. Okay, so let's talk about it. So here's an example of what this would look like. So we're gonna follow through this figure. So here's our surface. Here are some different illuminants. So sunlight is very yellow, right? Sunlight's pretty yellow. Sunsets are pretty red. Skylight is pretty blue. So here we have an instance of the surface. Um, so a surface is going to reflect different percentages of wavelengths. Here we have two different illuminants, one that's more yellow and one that's more blue. So now, when we add those together, we get a surface multiplied by that illuminant. So here's the relative amount of light. So notice that when we multiply this, the surface by the illuminant has more of a yellow shift, doesn't it? I'm kind of circling it here. Notice that when it's skylight, it's more of a blue shift. But here's what each of your three cones sees. Despite the fact that the illuminant is different and has more of a blue versus a yellow shift, the same ratio of cones is being activated and that allows us to see color constantly. So even though the surface has very different sets of numbers, the overall ratio is always the same. Now here, Here's yellow light, so we have more yellow and red. Here we have more blue. We discount the illuminant. We discount the fact that one is sunlight and the other is skylight, and we focus on our cone responses instead. Those are always gonna be the same. 
So physical, physical constraints help make constancy possible. We know that there are certain colors that cannot exist across different, different, uh, different types of surfaces. You and I have very good intelligent guesses about where the illuminant is coming from. So if I see something with a yellow cast, I'm going to assume that it's sunlight or yellow light or candlelight. If it's more of a red or an orange quality, it might be fire. If it's blue, it might be blue light from our screens. It might be blue light from being outside. So we make intelligent guesses about the illuminant and we also are going to make assumptions where the light source is as well as surfaces. So I didn't freak out when my car looked slightly different after dark because my brain knows that it's dark outside. My brain knows that very little light is available. And as a result, that electric blue is going to appear a little bit deeper to my eye. And that's how I have constancy. We are always taking constancy into account. Now, a lot of this part, guesses about the illuminant, light sources, and surfaces are all based on subjectivity, which means even though most of the time you and I see things the exact same way, if there is confusion about any one of these things, if we don't know what color the illuminant is, if we don't know what source the uh, the light source is, if we don't know what the surface is, you and I are going to have a situation where potentially we have very different perceptions of the same thing. Thankfully, though, most of the time we don't have to do this. So here you're looking at Granny Smith apples. This is a good apple. This is an apple that has had a lot of damage. And you can kind of see here that more damaged apples have more reflectance. However, these all still have the overall same pattern. They just have more of a shift to them. And additionally, the visual system knows certain things. Brightness changes if there's a shadow. So for example, here, we have this sudden strike that makes all of these colors darker. So it kind of appears to be a shadow, yes? Does this one look like a shadow? Why not? Why doesn't this one look like a shadow? Yeah. <laughs> Right. It's a so here we're just changing the brightness. It's a luminance change. This is a color change. Colors don't change in shadow, they only change their brightness. That looks like a shadow and indicates a shadow boundary. This does not indicate a boundary. All right. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop here. But here's what we're gonna talk about on Tuesday. We're gonna talk about that. <laughs> We're going to talk about that dang dress and we'll talk about why it happened. Um, but don't forget that you have a quiz that posts and you have a writing assignment due on the 20th. What? Wait, I can't hear you. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm giving back exams. Okay, let me just get out of this Zoom meeting first. I'm sorry. Was I snappy? That was bad. Yes, very simple.